And this is the third of the three uh, phase equilibrium software packages uh, being discussed in the workshop. And this one is the Theriac Domino software. And this is going to be presented by uh, Doug Tinkham. So I'll just give you a little bit of a background on, on Doug. So Doug is an associate professor and head uh, of the Harkwale School of Earth Sciences at Laurentian. Uh, he did his bachelor's degree at Rocky Mountain College in Billings, Montana. Uh, his master's at the University of Illinois and his uh, doctorate at University of Alabama. Some of Doug's research interests include development and programming of metamorphic phase equilibria algorithms uh, the development of quantitative x-ray mapping software, um, the effects of uh, metamorphism on hydrothermal alteration zones and e economic mineralizations in VMS uh, systems, uh, and integration of phase equilibrium modeling with geochronology to understand the, uh, the PT time evolution of metamorphic belts. And I would just like to add a kind of a personal note here. Uh, I consider Doug to be the gentle giant, one of the real underappreciated heroes of phase equilibrium modeling from all the work he's done in the background in the behind the scenes, translating thermocalc to theriac domino and providing some of the, uh, the, the working executables that so many of us use in our, um, in our phase equilibrium modeling. So it's with real uh, kind of thanks and admiration that um, I, I extend to Doug and I uh, welcome him to uh, tell us about Theriac Domino. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much for that generous introduction here. Um, as Dave mentioned, I'm Doug Tinkham, and today I'm going to give a basically an introduction to the software Theriac Domino, and I'll do a little bit of comparison um, to thermal calc along the way, uh, and I'll, I'll mention some things to, about Perplex. Uh, compared to Theriac Domino um, along the way. But I'll, like Mark, I had a hard time deciding how to pitch this talk because we have uh, a lot of participants who have not never used the software. And then we have some real experts out there um, who have used all three programs, you know, Thermocalc, Perplex, and Theriac Domino quite a bit. So what I've tried to do here is uh, set up a talk um, which will serve to introduce um, this tool set, Theriac Domino two tool set to new users. Um, and as I go through this, I, I've decided to highlight some things that I think are important from the user perspective, you know, what it takes to, uh, to be successful in using the software um, and you know, some different issues that might crop up while you're using the software. Um, so there is some material here, which will probably be helpful to uh, what I would consider intermediate users. Uh, as well. Uh, and as I go throughout here, I'll give some examples. So, you know, the topics I'll cover is an introduction to Theric Domino, you know, what it is, where to get it. I'm going to talk a little bit about the main algorithm uh, that Theric Domino uses. It is a Gibbs minimizer, very similar to Perplex, and there's a lot of similarities to Perplex. Uh, there's uh, some subtle differences. I will spend um, a decent amount of time on input files, um, primarily because I think this is, you know, particularly the database files and the solution model files. I think that this is one of the areas where new users um, can go wrong. Um, I'm not gonna tell you which data is the best data to use, but I will show you the database file and point out some features about the file. Um, because anybody who uses the program, you know, a moderate amount is going to have to open that database file and make some modifications here and there. Uh, it's important you have an idea of what you're doing. Um, I'll, I'll show a program called Thalia. Uh, that's one of the programs that comes with the Theriac Domino Suite. I will then move into the program Theriac uh, and Plot XY um, to show that. And then I will move into Domino. Now, Domino is the main program to generate diagrams. And I'll talk about that and pixel maps. Uh, I'll talk briefly about Theratur and Therabin, another couple programs. And then I'll, I'll end up with some, point out some pitfalls and I'll try to give a little bit of pointers and, and some advice uh, that might be helpful to new users. Um, before I get into the details, uh, you know, who's written the program and so forth, I want to give just a very broad overview of what that suite of programs actually will do. And it is a whole suite of programs, 10 or 11 programs uh, that come with a Theriac Domino package. 
Um, you know, from the simplest level, they, they allow you to calculate and plot thermodynamic properties of pure phases in your database, as well as the solution models within your database. There's actually some very powerful features there that are probably underused by um, the main user base. Um, the main program, Theriac, will let you calculate an equilibrium assemblage for some fixed bulk system composition um, or some range of bulk compositions. Um, you know, well, I'll point that out. And probably what a lot of, you know, most people want to use uh, their abdominal for it actually build diagrams. And the type of diagrams that their abdominal builds are what we call equilibrium assemblage diagrams. Um, and it can calculate these different diagrams um, for, you know, fixed bulk system composition or for some range of bulk compositions. And it'll calculate PT diagrams, uh, uh, what, you know, what in the thermocalc world you would call pseudo sections. Um, and temperature composition diagrams. Uh, so you can have a temperature axis, a pressure axis, and one axis is a compositional variable. Um, it will also do a, a nice type of diagram, which I actually use quite a bit, and these are XX diagrams. So, you know, example of this would be a, uh, a diagram where you have, you know, a range of iron number on one axis, and maybe a range of aluminum content on another axis at some fixed pressure and temperature. Uh, it will calculate ternary diagrams. These are not compatibility diagrams. Uh, they're not AFM projections, but they're ternary equilibrium assemblage diagrams or ternary pseudo sections. Um, not only can it calculate the equilibrium assemblage, but you can also contour the diagrams for various things such as the modal abundance of phases or the, the compositional variability of phases. And you can also um, contour diagrams for some system properties. Um, they also do, will make what we call pixel maps. And there's an example on the right. This is a pixel map. Uh, this is a simple pressure temperature diagram in the MNNCKF MASH system um, for a metapolitic bulk composition. It's just a weight percent H2O uh, that's tied up within the solid phases, as well as at high temperature, the amount of H2O that's tied up within the melt phase. Um, it does not calculate petrogenetic grids um, like thermocalc does. Um, nor will it do traditional reaction-based thermal barometry, uh, at least not in the traditional way that you're used to. So, you know, we'll not do the average PT style of thermal barometry, and we'll not do the wind tweak type of thermal barometry. But you can, of course, fix phase compositions and make some plots in PT space uh, uh, in, in that area. Now, the main program was written by Christian De Capitani, uh, who's currently at the University of Basel, Switzerland. Um, he wrote this program initially when he was doing his PhD uh, project, I believe, at UBC in Canada. Um, this particular suite of programs, like Perplex, uses Gibbs energy minimization. Um, thermal calc solves a nonlinear set of equations uh, that's written between the phases that the user specifies. Uh, it works on reactions between all the phases that the user specifies. Uh, but the Gibbs energy minimization um, works very similar to what Mark just described, uh, perplex. I'll point out a subtle difference later. The main algorithm uh, that Theragh Domino used was initially published in 1987 by Christian DeCapitani. And it, it, the algorithm has changed a bit over the years, but the overall uh, main stages of the algorithm, from what I can see when I look at the source code, uh, is basically very similar to the original algorithm that was published in 1987, but the details are quite different. It is written in Fortran, uh, and I think that one of the special things about the Theriac Domino Suite is Christian DeCaptani makes the source code available. In fact, when you download the program, the source code will automatically come with that download when you download it from the official um, Theriac Domino website. Uh, the source code is not technically open source, it is unlicensed, but Christian DeCapitani makes very clear statements in the user manual as well as on the website that the source code is there for users to modify. Uh, they just need to take responsibility for all their modifications. Um, one of the nice things about Theriac Domino, uh, one of the things I think is underappreciated, is that it does come with a very comprehensive user manual. Um, this is a user manual that describes the main programs. It doesn't go into great detail on every program, but it gives the user every bit of information they need to be successful in actually starting a program and doing a successful run. And I highly recommend that any user 
after they get started with their abdominal just a little bit, they, they dig into that user manual. Um, the program is distributed with multiple thermodynamic databases and solution models. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in, in a minute. So as I mentioned, the main algorithm was published in 1987 by uh, Christian DeCapitani and Tom Brown. Um, there was another paper in 2010, this is by Christian DeCapitani and Constantine Petrokikis. Um, that is a paper that describes Domino in great detail. And Domino is the, is the computer program that really makes the majority of the diagrams that the, the user uh, produces. Uh, so those are the, I would consider the two main publications uh, that really outline uh, two of the main programs uh, within the suite. So what are the programs in that suite? Theriac, as I mentioned, that's a command line program. It produces an equilibrium assemblage uh, based on user input. So you might give it a pressure and temperature condition. It will tell you what the equilibrium assemblage is uh, for whatever bulk composition you've specified. Domino is the program that generates uh, the information that's required to generate graphics files. So it you know, generates a wide range of XY diagrams as well as ternary diagrams. And these are all equilibrium assemblage diagrams. There are some other um, programs, Therabin and Theratur. Um, these are uh, basically programs that construct simple phase diagrams. And when I say by phase diagram, I mean diagrams where the compositions of the phase lie within the plane of the diagram. Um, and that's what Therabin and Theratur uh, do. And I'll give an example of that. Now, you know, Domino in an equilibrium assemblage diagram, um, what you're really doing is you're sectioning the total phase diagram, which is some, you know, for a 10 component system, it would be 11 or 12 dimensional diagram. You section it by holding all the bulk composition constant or range of bulk composition and pressure and temperature. Uh, and you generate a diagram that shows the equilibrium assemblages, but the compositions of the phases generally do not lie in that section plane. Uh, so that's the subtle difference between Domino and Therabin and Theratur. Um, there's a suite of programs, Guzzler, Xplot, Plot, XY, and MakeMath. These are all programs which take the output from Theriac or the output from Domino and Therabin and Theratur, and they're what generate graphics files. And most of the graphics files that are generated are, are some sort of vector graphics file that can be edited, edited in vector graphics software. Um, there's some other programs, Thermo and Thalia. I'll talk a little bit about Thalia. Uh, there's some other programs that come with the suite, um, which, but have not been heavily used as far as I know. Theriac, which in, is a program which will let you do calculations with aqueous phases. I've never used it because uh, uh, Christian DeCapitani has a statement that says it's not quite ready. Um, and I really haven't dug into it. And Theriac 3 is a, a newer program that I've not used much uh, at all. Um, and I might talk a little bit about that later. Uh, one of the nice things uh, is that there have been several add-ons and interface programs. Theria G is a program written by Fred Guides that um, it's actually distributed with Theria Domino and it lets you um, consider diffusion and chemical zoning in a phase like Garnet along PT pass as well as uh, integrating a little bit on nucleation uh, theory. Uh, Theriac-D is a relatively recent program by Eric Gusterhoff and Christian DeCapitani. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. The Bingo Antidote uh, by Eric Gusterhoff and Pierre Lenari. Um, Pierre's actually going to talk quite a bit about that in a later day, so I'm not going to talk uh, about that. In terms of locations, there's various locations you can get at the official um, distribution site. is from Christian DeCapitani's website, uh, and the link is, is shown there. Uh, over the years, I have also provided some files uh, that can be used with Theriac Domino. Uh, and there's a link where you can download those. Uh, I can tell you, I do have some new updates coming on uh, some new files in the next week or so. Um, and also the program can be uh, downloaded. It's part of the download with XMAP tools from Pierre Lenari. Um, and those are the three dominant places I know where you can actually get you know, files that work with Theriac Domino uh, or the programs themselves. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the uh, Gibbs minimization algorithm. Um, in the original 1987 paper, Christian DeCapitani describes essentially five stages uh, for the algorithm, the Gibbs minimization algorithm. I'm gonna boil it down to two. Um, 
imagine you have input bulk composition, some bulk system composition, and you have a database, a thermodynamic database uh, loaded up, and you have a set of activity models or solution models in that database. Um, what it does is it, it, it considers only pure phases in the first pass. It doesn't uh, consider any of the solid solution models. It'll consider all the pure phases that are active in the database, as well as the end members of, of the activity models. Um, and it will find um, what it considers a stable or uh, a local minimum assemblage from those pure phases. And it sort of sets those aside in a big array. And that's your solution array or your, you, know, you have a list of, you know, what minerals are, are the current equilibrium set of minerals in the calculation. Um, what is their composition? What is their abundance? And then it starts to work with the solution models. And I have some graphics to illustrate this in a bit. And basically it looks at each solution model in turn, uh, every activity model, and it sort of does a minimization uh, of each activity model. And what it does is it try to, tries to find um, you know, different compositions of that solid solution phase, uh, which have a minimum or a local minimum in Gibbs free energy. And it sort of sets those and adds them to a pool and it stores them. It, it loops through all of the, all of the different solutions uh, and it comes up with a, a group of local minimum for all the different uh, solutions. And then it goes on to step two. And what it does is it's got that array, which is the local solution. And it takes each one of those local minimums from the solid solution phases. And it tries to substitute them into the current working solution. And if it can substitute it in and form a new assemblage with a lower Gibbs free energy, it kicks out one of the old phases uh, and you have a new, um, stable assemblage and it just keeps looping through this and it does this in several stages. Um, now this is somewhat similar to perplex what Mark just described and then perplex uses these pseudo compounds um, and so it has a bunch of fixed phase compositions so you might have one solution model it's got eight end members and it might have 600,000 different fixed phases within it. In, in some way um, the ferric domino is doing something similar but in step one, when it's minimizing uh, the solution models, it is not considering that solution model as fixed individual phases. It actually considers all of the composition space of that solution model continuously, at least to you know, essentially machine precision. And it tries to find those local minimums. So it considers the full composition um, of the phase, not uh, a million little pseudo compounds. And that's a subtle difference between um, they're at nominal perplex. So I have some graphics here. Now these are modified um, from figure three of the 1987 paper, um, as well as um, some notes from Christian De Capitani from a Thera abdominal short course that he ran at the University of Calgary in 2010. So I'm going to show four different stages of this calculation um, and starting at the left in stage one, consider you're in a binary system. So that's the X at the bottom, it's a binary system. And the Y axis is Gibbs free energy. And uh, we, in this case, we have two solid solution phases, uh, A and B. Now in stage zero or loop zero, um, it doesn't consider the solid solution space. It just considers the compositions of the end members, A1, A2, and B1 and B2. Uh, it doesn't consider the compositions along the dashed line here in stage one. Now what it does is it, the bulk composition is shown in purple there uh, down at the bottom. And uh, I'm trying to uh, see if I can get a laser pointer going here. Okay, hopefully you can see my mouse. Down here in the purple, uh, that would be the bulk system composition you as a user would input here, 40% uh, component on the right, 60% uh, component on the left. And what it does is it, you know, it looks at the Gibbs free energy of A1, A2, B1, and B2. And this composition lies between those. So what it does is it tries to find what combination of A1, A2, B1, and B2 forms the lowest Gibbs free energy assemblage. And in this case, it's very clear that it's a combination of phase B1 and B2 um, is the, are, are the two pure phases that will form the equilibrium assemblage for this um, 
uh, bulk composition when we're only considering um, uh, pure phases. Now what it does is it does something very interesting. Notice that the Gibbs free energy of that assemblage here in this simple example is gonna be down around minus seven, uh, maybe seven kilojoules per mole, which is not reasonable, but it's just an example here. And what it's going to do is it's gonna say, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take those two B1s and B2s and I'm gonna do a translation on the Gibbs free energy function so that the Gibbs free energy of B1 and B2 lies at zero. And that's what we see on step two. Now, when it goes on uh, to the next stage, loop one is now going to consider the continuous composition space of solid solution A and solid solution B. And what it does is it, it goes through and it minimizes, it does a bunch of minimizations for phase one, and it finds a group of minimums. And in this case, it found one local minimum here that it's going to use. And it's gonna take this composition of this phase and it's gonna store it in that master array as a fixed phase. And it's gonna do the same thing for solution B. And it's gonna find a local minimum. And it's gonna store it in that array. And then what it's going to do is it's gonna to try to substitute you know, both of these compositions into the current working solution set to see if it can find a, a lower Gibbs free energy. And in this case, it, it would find a lower um, Gibbs free energy. And at that stage, it does the same thing. It finds these two points, which are the lowest Gibbs free energy. Now it's going to do a translation on the Gibbs free energy function so that these two points lie uh, and have a, a value uh, along the zero point. Okay. And it, it's going to go through and it's going to do an, uh, another loop. It's going to do a, another minimization. Now, these uh, open circles here were the closed circles here. So that these open circles were now the minimum on the last loop. And now what it's done, it's minimizing this function again, and it finds a, a new minimum, a little bit lower Gibbs free energy right there for phase A, and it finds a little bit lower Gibbs free energy for phase B there. And so then it tries to substitute these two solid points into the working solution set to see if it can find a lower Gibbs free energy assemblage, and it does. And it basically repeats this step over and over again until it gets um, reach some state of convergence. And these, in fact, would be the compositions of, of the two phases uh, that form the equilibrium minimum Gibbs free energy assemblage for this bulk composition. You know, phase B would have a composition here, and phase A would have a composition there. And that's basically how the minimization algorithm works. Um, a little bit about the database and solution models. Uh, when you download the program, you'll see that it, it ships with two uh, main uh, databases. It ships with the Berman database, 1988 database with various updates such as 1992. And there might even be some more recent slide updates within that file. And it ships with a couple of different versions of the Hall and Powell database, uh, data set 5.5 and um, data set 6.2 currently from the 2011 Holland Powell database. And when you look at those databases, um, what you'll see is that they also ship with the solution models or activity models for, for the different phases. And um, in Theriac Domino, both the in-member thermodynamic data from the Holland Powell databases, as well as the activity models uh, to describe solid solution phases, um, they're all, they all reside within one file. Um, this is both a good thing, but it's also a bad thing. We'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit later. Now, one of the nice things about Theriac Domino is it accepts a wide variety of activity models or solution models. Um, it will consider ideal mixing on sites formulations uh, and molecular mixing models for the ideal activity. And for the excess Gibbs free energy function, uh, the non-ideal activity, um, it does have a wide variety of excess models it can consider, such as the regular solution model, uh, symmetric formalism model. Both of those uh, describe a, a symmetric Gibbs excess function, but it also um, it takes uh, models that have an asymmetric Gibbs excess function, such as asymmetric formalism and the subregular solution model. And it also has um, another type of excess model, which I haven't used much, um, but you can actually specify interaction parameters for with insight mixing between atoms on individual sites. And in this respect, I find Theriac is much more flexible than thermocal. 
uh, with thermal calc, you're pretty much locked into two types of activity models, the non-ideal activity models, the symmetric formalism and the asymmetric formalism. As far as I know, you cannot use a subregular solution model in program thermal calc. Uh, where you, as you can use those, and I'm, I'm, I know you can use all of those in perplex as well. One of the great things about theory at Domino is because it does come with source code, you can get the Fortran code, which is a little bit of programming. And there are some instructions in the user manual on how to do this. If you have a special activity model, which doesn't fit one of these uh, models um, listed here in the top point, something a little bit different, takes a little bit special calculation, you can program them in. And it's not that difficult to do. As I said, there are instructions to do this. And this is one of the things that I think makes their abdominal very special um, because it comes with the source code and you have the freedom to do this. Um, I'll give you one of the examples where we need to do this are basically all the melt models uh, that are used with the Holland and Powell database. They all use an interesting entropy calculation. They don't quite fit the normal um, mixing models. Um, and, and we actually have to hard code them into the program. Okay, uh, one point I need to make that read the user manual uh, when you get the chance, I think it's very good. I wanna go through quickly the parts of the database. Um, this is an example of some of the in-member thermodynamic data, in this case from the Holland and Powell database. Um, you'll see these flags with three stars, gas data, three stag stars, mineral data. Uh, these are sort of keywords here. Whenever you see these three stars, there should be a keyword after it. And what it means is that, okay, after this point, everything that it reads, it's gonna consider a gas phase. Uh, it doesn't really control the way it calculates the thermodynamic properties for that phase. It really just calculates the way it reports the properties of those phases. And likewise, for the mineral data, uh, th this keyword um, dictates how it reports the properties for those phases. The things that actually uh, determine, you know, how the thermodynamics for each phase are, are, are calculated are these flags here, SPC, which stands for special. This is an internal fluid routine, Pitzer Sterner 1994. That's what the Holland Powell 2011 database uses. Um, and then there's other uh, flags here, ST, that stands for standard state properties. So that would be the line that has the enthalpy of formation of the entropy and the volume at reference state conditions. C, you'll see various C, C1, C2, C3, C4, uh, different um, uh, parameters go with the heat capacity coefficient. Um, and so these are the these are the things that control how the thermodynamics are calculated and what the data represents on the lines. Um, a little bit about the activity models for solution data. And here's an example uh, of the White et al. 2014 biotype model coded up in Thera at Domino. Again, we have three stars, which indicates there's some keyword here, and the keyword here is SOL. Uh, so it's written solution data, it really looks for SOL. Um, and so it says, okay, after this line, it's gonna read data and it's gonna expect that data to be in a format that's appropriate to describe the mixing uh, between phase components in some um, solid solution phase or fluid phase. Um, in this case, uh, there's various things. I don't wanna go into great detail here. Uh, minus site, this is an interesting thing. You see the minus site here, the minus sign in front of the word site. What it means is that some of the phase components within, within that activity model can take on negative values. And this is a feature of the Holland and Powell symmetric formalism and asymmetric formalism models. It's very common for phase components to actually take on negative values. Um, and so, you know, we, we generally consider those proportions of phase components instead of mole fractions of phase components. The other thing uh, is how you describe the site mixing. So for the calculation of the ideal activity for this biotite activity model, we use what's called an ideal mixing on sites formulation. Um, and basically um, we list what are the different sites. So GEM3, M12, TV, uh, and, and you list, you know, what's the site multiplicity, you know, which means how many entities reside on that site. So one here, two for M12. And then you list the entities which can mix on that site. And most people get confused here. Do not get confused. These do not represent, there does not need to be any correspondence between these characters here 
and the system components of the system. So this magnesium here does not necessarily have to mean the exact same as magnesium in your system component. Um, it's a minor point, but it trips up some people sometimes. So I use um, F3. Now F3 is not an element, uh, but it's just a symbol I use to designate ferric iron in this particular structure. But you know, F3 is typically not part of a system component. Typically, you just have iron. So that describes the site mix, uh, mixing. And then you have the list of the phase components. And then you list you know, what is the site composition of each phase component. That's what's listed here for the titanium biotite member. Um, so that describes uh, the ideal activity calculation. Uh, it's going to use that data. Now we're going to move on to the non-ideal non part. And the keyword uh, margulies uh, tells you that you're dealing with non-ideal activity parameters coming up. And in this particular case for this model, it's a symmetric formalism model. So it has a, a, a symmetric excess Gibbs free energy across the binaries. And um, there's one interaction parameter for each binary. So this is the interaction parameter between the phlogopite and ordered biotite end member that describes the excess Gibbs free energy, 4,000 joules per mole. And uh, that's one other thing to know is the thermal calc, uh, the base units of thermal calc is kilojoules, um, whereas the base units of theriac domino is joules. So when you compare the files, you need to have, take that into consideration. Um, you know, this would be listed as four kilojoules per mole in the thermal calc file. I want to very briefly, um, this is quite complicated uh, and a little bit hard to see. But what I, I want to do is make a comparison of a thermal calc solution model and a theriac domino solution model. Uh, and the example I've shown here is the Elmanite model. This is the 2000 White et al. Elmanite model, um, which has hematite, uh, ordered Elmanite, and a disordered Elmanite end member. So three phase components within this model. Um, so it involves ordering of iron and titanium across sites. And you can see that here in the theriac domino input file on the left, down here in the solution model, we have ordered elmanite and disordered elmanite. And you can see that directly. You can see that the ordered elmanite end member has two irons on what we designate as the A site and two titaniums on the B site, whereas the disordered end member has both iron and titanium on both sites. So uh, an iron, a titanium, and an iron, a titanium on both of those sites. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with the in chemical formula of elmanite, you realize it's FeTiO3. And so if that's the formula unit we're using for elmanite, there's not two entities on that site. There's only one. Um, and there's a special flag here, one half, uh, which is used to basically tell you to reduce the number of elements on each side by a half. That's essentially what it does. Um, in the thermal calc file, um, at least with all the new uh, thermocalc files on the HPX EOA, o, EOS website, they're all very nicely formatted and very well commented. Uh, and most of them will have uh, th basically the same information here, which shows the site distribution for the different phase components. In this case, it appears in a comment section in the thermocalc file, indicated by these percentage signs, but it appears directly in the code that's read from the ferric domino file. Um, one of the reasons I showed this, and this is really not for new users, this is really for more uh, advanced users, is that there are some other places where there's some equivalents. Now, you know that in thermocalc, if you're an advanced user, it, it, typically you make a new end member from existing end members. And that's what's shown here for this ordered elmanite end member. Use, thermocalc uses make here, and then one, and then has a disordered flag, and it's going to use elmanite. So it's going to make the ordered elmanite out of the existing elmanite end member. Uh, but it's got this keyword flag or keyword disordered here. And that's a flag to thermal calc to tell it basically, uh, you know, elmanite is itself uh, an ordered end member that's described by Landau uh, ordering in the Holland and Powell database. And so what this disordered uh, keyword does is it tells thermal calc to strip off the Landau properties that reference conditions and also strip them off at elevated P and T. And that gives you essentially a disordered uh, elmanite. And then um, thermocalc will add on a DQF parameter here, uh, which to, and they use the symmetric formalism to describe the ordering within the elmanite. And in theriac domino, uh, the equivalent of make is what we call COM. That stands for combine. 
And so that's what we're shown here under ordered Elmanite one, COM. Now COM it says uh, Elm D minus one. So that, what it's saying is, hey, make the new end member Elmanite one out of the existing end member Elm D uh, minus. And that Elm D minus will appear somewhere else in the database file. And this is an example of it. And whoever constructed this file, which in this case was me, um, actually generated that end member. I, I've stripped off the Landau properties for you and that appears in the database. So that's just sort of a comparison of the two different uh, input files. Um, something there for new users, but also something there for advanced users. Now, this is probably what I think is one of the most underutilized programs, because when I talk to most people, they don't know about it. Now, when I talked to Pierre Lenari the other day, he knew about it, he uses it all the time. But Thalia is a program which lets you plot uh, thermodynamic properties uh, for both uh, uh, pure phases as well as across uh, binaries through your solid solution space. And so I, I've, give, I've just given one example here. We just looked at Elmanite. So I took that Elmanite model from White at all 2000 and at 600 degrees C and one kilobar. Um, I, 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 I took a slice through it um, along the uh, disordered Elmanite to the ordered Elmanite uh, binary here, and I set the proportional hematite to zero. And all I did was I calculate the Gibbs free energy across that uh, disordered to ordered uh, binary. And what you see here is this is like, this is, it shows us where the minimum Gibbs free energy is. Um, and if, if you think about it, the disordered Elmanite end member has the same bulk composition as the ordered uh, Elmanite end member. The only difference is they have a different site composition, but their bulk composition is identical. And so what this is showing you is this shows showing you the equilibrium state of ordering in your Elmanite across this binary at 600 degrees C and one kilobar. Um, now, if you read the thermocalc file, you would realize, well, actually the ordered M member can take on uh, at least uh, when the proportion of hematite is zero, it can take on a value from minus one to one. So I said, well, let's redo this diagram and let's look at the Gibbs free energy across this full spectrum of ordered in, uh, Elmanite um, composition. So, and you, what you see is you have two minimums that are essentially at the same place. So Thalia is used, is quite useful. And you can use this to go across binaries uh, in your amphiboles, in your pyroxenes, look at the Gibbs free energy curves, uh, enthalpy, uh, excess Gibbs free energy, as well as the activities. And here's an example of an activity diagram that was calculated with program Thalia. So this is across uh, H2O CO2 binary uh, in the COH fluid uh, with an interaction parameter of 12 kilojoules per mole. And you can see the activities at 400, 500, and 600. Um, and this is almost the raw output from program Thalia. Uh, what I had to do was, you know, touch up the title here and add a title to it. And then I, you know, I cleaned up some of the, uh, some of the labels here. But the lines uh, and the grid, that's straight out of uh, program Thalia. Um, after you run it through one of the graphics processors. So that's the kind of output you can expect to get. So I wanna move on uh, now to Theriac. Um, so Theriac is the main program um, which calculates the equilibrium assemblage. Um, so this screenshot, it's a command line program. Um, and so, you know, you can input a PNT uh, and a bulk system composition and you hit go and you get the output. And this is the kind of output you would get from program theory after the command line. So after I did a run, it plots out the equilibrium assemblage. So it lists the phases, you know, pure type, some mixed fluid, uh, some solid solution garnet. And then it lists the end members in those uh, uh, phases and it lists their abundance. So this would be the proportions of the phase components, but it also lists the activities of the phase components. And if you scroll down a little bit further, this is really the main data table you're gonna look at from Theriac. It lists your full assemblage in a nice table form and it gives you various data like the, the number of moles of the phases, uh, the volume percent of the phases, the weight, as well as the densities of the different phases. And it separates uh, what it considers solid phases from what it considers fluid phases. Um, and you can actually control this uh, based on that gas data and mineral data parameter that I talked about in the database file. Uh, when I run this, I typically look at the volume percent uh, output uh, and um, I kind of get a mental image of you know, what this rock might look like uh, just based on looking at the volume percent output. 
Uh, Theriac, you can also run in loops. So you can say, all right, run over this PT trajectory um, and you know, do 100 increments from PT1 to PT2, calculate the equilibrium assemblies of every single point. And what it does is it dumps out a ton of data to text files. Um, and you know, it dumps out system, pro uh, system properties such as Gibbs free energy, entropy, volume, uh, density of the solids, weight, weight percent of H2O in solids. Uh, but it also dumps out files that contains data on properties of all the phases. Um, even your solid solution phases, such as the abundance of the phases, the density, of magnesium number, silica performing unit, aluminum performing unit, uh, the weight of H2O in each of the phases, uh, moles, uh, activity, and importantly, all the site compositions, all the site fraction compositions for your solid solution phases. So you can run a loop and you have a folder that's got hundreds of files in it, and then you can take those files and you can actually plot them with another program that comes with Theriac Domino. And that program is called Plot XY. So I ran a, a Theriac loop. Uh, and uh, in this case, um, uh, from five kilobars, 450 degrees C to seven kilobars and 700 degrees C. And um, I then run Plot XY over that output and it generates uh, a postscript output file. Um, in this case, I've plotted up the moles of the different phases. So black lines, the moles of muscovite, purples, the moles of biotite, uh, moles of plagioclase, and moles of garnet. And this is for a fixed composition all along uh, that path. So you can see where, where certain minerals are reacting out and other minerals are reacting in. So as we go from low temperature here, you can see, well, this is what happens to albite. It starts up at three moles and then it, it dies off. And that is at the point where the plagioclase uh, solid solution comes in. Okay, so you can easily see where some of the main uh, reactions and assembly changes are there. You can also plot on the right-hand side mineral chemistry. In this case, I plotted the, um, the mole fraction of elements on sites in, uh, in garnet, uh, iron, calcium, manganese, and magnesium as we go up temperature. Um, you know, that file setup time took me about five minutes. I'm an advanced user, so it'll take you longer. The calculation time, and I, um, I did 100 increments across there. So it did a, it gives a minimization of 100 points across there and it took 1.8 seconds, or one minute and 1.8 seconds. Uh, you know, and then the drafting, you know, the coloring of the lines, adding of the title and so forth, you know, that took me the most time, 30 to 45 minutes. Um, you can also look at garnet fractionation. Uh, well, fractionation of anything. Um, you can, when you run Theriac, you can set up what's called a driver file. I'm not going to go through the driver file, uh, but in that driver file, uh, you can set the stepping, uh, but you can also set fractionation of certain phases. You can say, okay, if garnet is stable, as I go from one step to the next, take out all of the garnet from the system. Uh, or you can say, maybe only take out 50% of the garnet or 90% of the garnet. And, and so as you move along that path, um, you could fractionate garnet. Right? You can also take out the fluid if you want it, or you could take out melt. That's something we do quite commonly. Okay, and I'm not going to go through this in details because I think I'm going to run out of time. But basically, I did this for a fractionation case. I fractionated 90%, 98% of the garnet. And when you compare uh, this one to the previous diagram with no fractionation, you'll see there's some differences. Um, and uh, the chemistry of the garnet is a little bit different. I mean, the zoning is basically very similar, but garnet completely stops at about 600 degrees C. So you can do fractionation calculations quite easily, and you can set up different PT paths within the, the driver file. Now, a little bit about plot XY. That was the program I used to actually generate all those plots we just looked at. Now, this is a screenshot of the program uh, when you run it from the command line. So for this particular case, you can see I have uh, 238 files that were generated. Uh, and these are all the different um, output text files. And um, sometimes you need to recombine those files. And so what it's done is it's separated out a file for the moles of garnet where almondine was the most abundant end member. And it, it separated that from a file where the showed the moles of garnet where Groschler was the most abundant in member. 
And so what's happened is as you move along that trajectory from 450 to 700, you start off uh, with at some point in time, probably in this case, the maybe more grossular rich, lower temperature, and then it became more ammonium rich. I'm, I'm not sure of that. Go back and look at the diagram. But you need to combine those when you run plot x, y. The way you do that is each one of these files has a number with it. So when I run plot x, y at the command line, this is what I would type, 103 plus 107. And that would combine those two files and produce one line. Now a little bit about Domino. We need to move on to program Domino. Now Domino is the main program to generate your, your XY uh, equilibrium assemblage diagrams or your ternary assemblage diagrams. And the details of this are outlined in um, uh, Decapitani and Prototicus in 2010. It's actually very similar to the perplex grid minimization strategy. Uh, I have quite a few details here. Now in this case, it's a PT run. Uh, so pressure, temperature, uh, equilibrium assemblage diagram we're gonna run. And when you first start Domino, it's, it's, it forms a grid and it's a very coarse coarse grid like this. And um, it, it, it's going to work on the coarse grid, grid and then um, refine the calculation as it goes along. So on the initial pass, it's going to start down the lower left hand corner of your diagram. And it's, it's going to go up temperature in this case. And each one of those 10 dots underneath, it, it calculates what the equilibrium assemblage is at each one of those 10 points. And it keeps track of what those assemblages are. And it records those assemblages. Now in this particular example run, um, the first three points, uh, we had this assemblage. One point we had a different assemblage and then all the last points had this assemblage. So there, there were three different assemblages that it picked up on the initial pass at those orange points. And what it's gonna do is it says, okay, the assemblage didn't change between these three points. So it's not gonna go back there and look at that space, but the assemblage did change between these points and these points. So before it moves on to higher pressures, it's gonna go back and it's gonna do some refinement uh, between those points where the assemblage changed, okay? And in this case, you know, there must be several assemblage changes uh, between these two points and, and one assemblage change between those two points. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna go back and look at closer and closer spacing and it's gonna track down um, and it's gonna do minimizations at all those points until it locates the boundary for that equilibrium assemblage change, usually within you know one degree or half a degree, depending on the size of your diagram, but it very closely finds the location of those equilibrium changes. And then what it does is it does the rest of the diagram along its coarse grid spacing. So it moves up pressure and it goes along there. And as it goes along there, it does exactly the same thing it did here. And then when it's done, gone up pressure, it then does the same thing as it go, jumps up temperature It'll go along these arrows. And that gives you, takes you to the end of level zero. And at the end of level zero, uh, you're actually, it's gonna produce a crude diagram when it's done with level zero. Um, and it will eventually go on to level one, level two, level three, level four, generally up to about level five. And at the end of um, the first level there, you can actually grab the output and you can actually run it through a program Guzzler and Xplot. You can, you can plot up the diagram. And this is what the diagram looks like at the end of the first level. So what you see, see is that it, it's found points between all the coarse grid here. And wherever it saw this assemblage change, well, it evidently it found this assemblage change between these two orange points here. And then it also found that assemblage change up there. And it also found it along that between these two orange points and it basically connects them with straight lines. And uh, at this stage, it, it looks at the lines that it's formed and it says, okay, this one has a very angular boundary. So in the next level, it's gonna go back in and do a bunch of local minimizations in this area uh, to try to smooth that out. And it also can determine that, hey, this is the end of a line. That line is just sort of ending, it must continue on. So it's gonna do a bunch of minimizations only there. But up here, it's not gonna go back up here and look in this area anymore up in the top left because it didn't detect any assemblage changes. And so, you know, basically uh, Domino does the same thing that Perplex does. It brackets the location of the assemb assemblage changes uh, between two very closely spaced Gibbs minimizations where the assemblage changed. And in Farag Domino, usually that's within, you know, half a degree or less. 
Um, now, thermocalc, on the other hand, uh, you as a user, you, you tell it, hey, here's the minerals I want to consider, and I want to calculate the mode zero line for a mineral, uh, you know, from eight kilobars down to four and a half kilobars, uh, uh, and you have to tell it to actually calculate that line. You have to tell it to calculate all those lines. So that's a fundamental difference. And thermal cal calculates the exact location of those lines uh, in some intervals. Now, this is almost a raw final diagram produced by Domino. Now, this is an MNNCKF MASHO. I didn't include titanium. Uh, and I have to tell you, that was totally by mistake. It was not on purpose. Uh, but like Mark said, even experienced users make mistakes. I forgot to put the titanium in. Um, but, you know, this is, a, this is a diagram. It took two and a half hours to construct this diagram. And that's more or less the raw diagram on the right-hand side. Now, I made my labels really small. That's just something I do. Um, when I'm looking at this, but each one of those lines or most of those lines has a number on it. And there's a text file I can go look up and I can figure out exactly what that line represents, you know, what phase or phases went to zero mode along that line. Um, but that is the raw diagram, except for the title. I've added the title uh, and I bolded pressure and temperature uh, and I put this label with the right. That's all I did. This is a raw diagram. Now, this is a good result. I have to say, uh, 70% of the time, your result will not be quite as good, but this just happened to be a really good one. Um, for the most part, the metapolitic uh, rock calculations produce really nice diagrams. Now, the one thing that we can't do with um, the Therag Domino Suite is we can produce a postscript output file and an SVG graphics file on this, but it does not fill in the polygons. Uh, so for users of ThermoCalc, you use um, the draw PD program that comes with ThermoCalc and, and you generate nice, beautiful publication quality graphics output uh, with nice fills in your polygons. Uh, Therag Domino does not do that at this stage. Now, so what you do is you end up having to draft them up. And this is an example of um, a couple diagrams. Now this is from Taos Jorgensen who did his PhD here, finished up a couple years ago. And he was working on metabasalt. So these are actually um, uh, metabasite rock compositions uh, from here in Sudbury in the contact oil um, uh, using the green et al. 2016 set of activity models. Uh, and it did a pretty good job. Now Taos did some cleanup in places. Uh, but I, one of the things, I, one of the reasons I wanted to show this diagram is because this is nice equilibrium assemblage diagram. Um, but with, you know, the boundaries between the assemblages. But you can also instead of calculating the equilibrium assemblage boundaries, you can calculate contours uh, you know, of mineral compositions, of mineral modes, uh, and of system uh, properties. And that's what's shown here in the red lines, and uh, which is the volume percent of melt that's produced, and the blue lines, which is the mole fraction of the northlight in your feldspar. Now, one of the nice things about program Domino is you can generate pixel maps. Um, the, this is an example of what you do is you, you set up dom, um, Domino and you run it in a grid. And in this case, I believe I used 250 points in the X direction uh, and 250 points uh, in the Y direction. And um, basically, it just calculates the equilibrium assemblage everywhere along there. And um, it produces, you use a, a program, um, make map, and it'll produce uh, the gray map in the background in the grid here. And in this case, I overlaid uh, the equilibrium assemblage diagram calculation on top of it. You can convert those to color, um, such as shown there in some third party, third party software, such as MHJ. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to skip over that, but the, you do get a lot of different output uh, when you do a pixel map run, um, system properties, as well as phase properties that you can plot up. And I just generated a simple Mathematica script basically about three nights, four nights ago. I just generated a script and it runs through every one of those output files and it generates a map like you see here. So this is just an example of some different maps, color maps such as uh, this one, which is the number of moles of H2O and solid phases. Um, percent of H2O in the solids, the density of the solid phases, uh, the number of moles of H2O in the system, 
So you can see, you know, the amount of, uh, this is a closed system calculation. So as the amount of H2O in your solid phases decreases, you're dehydrating the rock. Um, if you don't let that fluid escape, well, you then end up too much fluid in your system. And so these are sort of the opposite of one another. Um, this is an example of the volume um, of solid phases. Therater and Therben, this is an example of the iron titanium uh, uh, oxygen system. Um, so FeO, Fe2O3, TiO2. And so all of these phases on here, rutile, elmenite, opal magnetite, hematite, and iron periclase, uh, all those phases lie within the plane of this diagram. And so when you generate one of these, you can see the different assemblage fields, but you also get tie lines between coexisting phases, which are quite nice. Um, there are, have been several uh, add-ons and extensions that have been added uh, to Theriac Domino, or at least programs which can interface uh, with Theriac. Um, one of them is Theriac D. Um, this is an example of output from Theriac D. Uh, I, believe, I believe this runs on a, uh, on a MATLAB script. Um, in this case, he's plotting solid rock density. So density is a function of depth and temperature here. We're looking at a downgoing slab in a subduction zone. Uh, amount of hydrogen in the fluid phase and uh, the amount of garnet that's produced. And so there are various, I'm pretty sure this is a MATLAB extension. And this is a, I, I looked at this, this is very nice because it gives an example of, you know, how you can interface uh, software with um, Theriac, uh, but it also gives an example of how you, you can call Theriac uh, subroutines directly from your own compiled program. So the compiled program is C or C++, and you can, you can link it up to uh, Theriac. Uh, there are other examples here, which I'm not going to cover today, Theria G, uh, and Bingo Antidote, which Pierre Lenari is going to talk about. Um, usage, pitfalls, and pointers. Um, I'm going to go through some of what I consider the most common user issues that I've noticed uh, with new users. Um, if you use a solution models in a database that has a bunch of ferric iron in members in it, and um, those are all activated uh, and your bulk system composition does not have any extra oxygen in it. So you can't make ferric iron. This time sometimes causes significant problems. Um, and, you know, the program internally doesn't distinguish between ferric and ferrous iron uh, for most databases. Most database files, you just have one iron system component and then you have an oxygen system component. And by adding, adding a little bit of extra oxygen to your system composition, you essentially can convert some ferrous iron to ferric iron if iron is the only element with a variable valence state in your system. Now, if you have no extra oxygen, you have no ferric iron in your system composition, what happens is the program tries to make some of those ferric iron in member state stable. And what happens is the mass balance doesn't work out and um, it doesn't find good solutions everywhere. And you, you'll notice this right away. There's two ways to notice it. First of all, your, diet, your calculation takes forever. Uh, if you're doing an XY diagram, I mean, if it produces a diagram, you'll see a lot of squiggly lines all over the place in various parts of the diagram telling you that the algorithm failed. Um, there's two ways to uh, resolve this. Uh, one is you can com out, comment out the ferric iron in members in your database. And I give some advice here on how you would do that. Uh, the alternative is to add just a little bit of extra oxygen to your bulk system composition. And this would allow just a small amount of those ferric phases to become stable. It's a little bit of trial and error on how much oxygen you need to add to let just a little bit of ferric iron in there become stable. But that's, um, there's two ways to do that. And I also have some information on my website about that. So that, like I, I received an email last night from a user um, and this was the exact problem that they had. Um, entering the bulk system composition correctly. Now, you know, Theriac uh, Domino takes its bulk system composition in terms of molar elements, not oxides. Thermal calc takes molar oxides. A ferric domino takes the elements. And also it does not take weight percent, it takes you know, relative molar proportions of elements. Um, this is just an example here um, of a bulk composition line or part of a bulk composition line that we'd enter. And by convention, when you open your database and you look at the database header, you're gonna see all the system components. And by convention, we use all uppercase for the system components, but you could change that. 
Um, so this would be one way to enter the composition Fe304, a magnetite. And that composition, as we see, you know, Fe304, if it's pure magnetite, you know, it's equivalent to one FeO and two FeO one halves, one and a half. So two fair atoms, and one ferrous atom. That's sort of what that'd be equivalent to. Now, when you also when you enter a bulk system composition, you have lots of elements, and you, you know, you have your 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 main elements, you know, you have two to three decimal places on them. Um, it becomes important on how you calculate your oxygen. And you want to enter just exactly the right amount of oxygen. Um, and sometimes if there's a little bit of rounding error in your Excel output and um, you end up adding just not the right amount of oxygen to go with all your elements, your bulk system composition won't be quite right. Um, and and um, so what you can do is after you've entered all of your main cation elements, let's say, you can enter oxygen with a question mark. And that question mark tells the program, I'm going to calculate the amount of oxygen that's required to go with all the elements that I've added in their, in their default valence state. And then if you want to, you can add just a little bit of extra oxygen after that question mark. This would be equivalent to adding the extra oxygen in thermal calc um, when you uh, add ferric iron to your system. Okay. Uh, the other problem that I commonly see is the program installation and startup problems. As Mark mentioned with program perplex, um, when the program is compiled, if it's compiled by the GNU uh, compilers, G Fortran in this case, it's compiled by G Fortran, it will be dependent on a GCC library. And um, uh, when, when somebody installs those uh, executables with those binaries on their computer and their computer does not have those libraries, you'll get a link error a runtime link error and it won't run. Um, so one way around this is installing the GCC libraries, which can be difficult on Windows. It's pretty easy on Mac. I assume it's very easy on Linux as well, but it's actually a bit of a nightmare on Windows unless you're used to it. Um, so there's another alternative. You can download um, uh, some binaries from alternate sites uh, if the newest binaries are there. I'm pretty sure that uh, XMAP Tools has recent binaries in it. My website has slightly older binaries at it. So that, that's the other problem I see, it's common. Um, I'll talk very briefly about this because this kind of relates to statements people made about thermal calc throughout the workshop. Um, Theric Domino, the database file has a, a feature called seeds. Uh, it, there was a, an equivalent version for older versions of the program, but for new versions of the program, you can enter what's called seeds in your database file. And basically seeds represent some equilibrium compositions of phases. You can think of them as starting guesses. Uh, these are not required for successful runs generally. However, they do help. So what I generally do, what I've started to do is if, I, if I'm gonna do a new pseudo section or equilibrium assemblage diagram, you know, from, from 400 to 700 degrees C and one to 10 kilobars, what I'll do is I'll run Theriac at the corners of that diagram. And uh, Theriac will output uh, the data, the seed data. And I run, so I, I run at the corners of the diagrams and then I'll run some in a few interior points of the diagrams, make sure I get starlight in one of the assemblages. And uh, then I'll open up the log file, Theriac run log, and I'll copy and paste the seed output from that file and I'll paste it right into my database file. And that in fact represents starting guesses. So, so when the Gibbs minimizer runs, it will actually read those seeds and it will try to start a minimization from uh, all of those different seeds compositions. And um, sometimes that speeds up the calculation quite a bit, I've noticed. So it, it's another thing I will recommend people do. And finally, uh, direct comparisons to do uh, thermal calc produced diagrams. Um, this is a diagram I produced uh, back in 2018, it looks like. A and this is, um, this is the Beard and Lofgren experimental 478 run. So it's a metabasite composition. Uh, it's pseudo section in NCKF Mastro using the green 2016 set of activity models. Um, and, you know, I found that I can pretty much generate almost any thermal calc diagram um, in, the, for the, in this metabasite system and the metapelite system. If I do exactly what Mark says. If I make sure I'm using exactly the same in-member data and exactly the same 
um, solution model data. Uh, I, we can, you can regenerate those diagrams almost perfectly. Um, now, sometimes you, to make sure you're using exactly the same activity models, I actually went in and I generated the diagram on the left myself in thermocalc. So I generated that entire diagram in thermocalc. Um, it didn't take very long because I generated the diagram on the right first. I generated the diagram in theriac domino. So once I had the diagram in theriac domino, pretty much I knew exactly every single line I needed to calculate in thermocalc because I already did it. And I went in and it probably only took me about four hours to generate that diagram on the left in thermocalc. Now, if I didn't have the diagram on the right, it probably would have taken me 12 hours, 15 hours to generate that in thermocalc. Um, I started using thermocalc in 1997, uh, but I don't use it as much anymore. So I'm a little bit slower than I used to be. But in this case, you pretty much reproduce it exactly. Um, you're off by about a half a degree up at uh, high pressure and high temperature, uh, but everywhere else it's basically an exact match. And that, you know, the diagram on the right is pretty much the raw diagram. Uh, for metabasites, when you run it theriac domino and domino diagram, they don't always look quite that good. Uh, you will get some jagged lines. Sometimes a line will maybe disappear for a short segment and so forth. And with that, I'm going to end. Uh, and um, I, I leave uh, some references here. Uh, and I'll take questions. And um, if you look in the PDF uh, for this talk, you will see there's some additional uh, slides down at the um, end that you can look at. Well, terrific. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Doug, for a very comprehensive uh, treatment of uh, theriac domino, uh, including some of the pitfalls. Now, um, we've heard talks on three incredibly powerful phase equilibrium modeling software packages, thermocalc, FPT, uh, perplex, and now theriac domino. And uh, for, well, even experienced users, but perhaps especially for novice and intermediate users, you might be the point th of thinking, you know, that these are all fantastic programs. You know, <laughs> which one am I, which one of these am I going to use? And uh, so, um, what we've planned for Friday, the, the first topic on the Friday session, is going to be what you might call a high-level comparison between the different programs with some of the uh, pros and cons. So that's just kind of an, an advertisement, uh, if not all the questions get answered at this point. Hey Dave, can I make one statement on that? Sure. We're gonna give those examples and comparisons, but you know, I'm a firm believer that you should be using all three. Um, I use thermocalc and, and, and theriac domino, those are the two I use. I don't use perplex as much, um, but you know, I'm a firm believer that you know, people should become versatile in all three. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about their strengths uh, and uh, weaknesses uh, and comparisons on Friday. Great. Okay, so at this point, we're going to move to a Q&A session. And uh, we're not going to have a break uh, uh, like yesterday before the end of the Q&A because it's, um, it, we have 35 minutes to go. Uh, so I think we'll start with some questions directed towards uh, Doug from, uh, we've had a number of questions have, that have come in. And then for the last 15 or 20 minutes or so, 15 minutes maybe, uh, then we'll have some questions which are open to both um, uh, Mark and Doug uh, per pertaining to Perplex and Theriac Domino. So I'll turn things over to uh, Jacob now. Okay, thanks Dave. And yeah, thanks Doug for a really comprehensive talk. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leap right in with these questions. Um, someone asking, can the thermodynamic data be mixed up between different database files? Uh, I think this is probably in reference to what Mark was talking about in Perplex and that it's quite easy to select wrong uh, things. And are there any compatibility issues, the second part of the question, between databases, such as different equations of state? Well, yes, uh, absolutely. You can uh, mix them. Um, I'm not saying that's a good idea. I, I don't want to do it but that you can. Um, the database format is extremely flexible in Theriac Domino. I can put in, I could put in Berman data with the Holland and Powell data with Sucrit data if I wanted to. 
I would never do that, but the flexibility is there so that you can do that. Um, now, you know, people have different philosophies. Uh, I'll give you an example. When you download um, the database file for Holland Powell, uh, data set 6.2 from uh, Christian DeCaptani's site, he provides a very comprehensive um, data or activity model file uh, for data set 6.2. And so in that one database file, he will have activity models that, you know, would have been developed by White at all 2014 and, uh, for data set six for metapelites. Um, and there will also be uh, data in there for the metabasites. Um, and, you know, you could even put some of the high pressure melt model uh, data in there. Um, so, you know, I think there's different philosophies on that. I would say for a new user, I don't think that's a great idea. Uh, because new users can um, accidentally mix, mix and match where they might not be able to. But for uh, you know, a graduate student or an experienced user who's doing research in this area, it's actually not a bad thing if they take the time to read the database file. And I think that's the most important thing. I think too, too often people just grab the database file, uh, start turning things on and off, and run with it. And they don't actually take the time to read the comments in the file. Uh, the files that I distribute you know, on my website is I, what I've been doing is I, I try to take the thermal calc file. So the new files I'll put up will be the TCMP50 uh, file from the HPX EOS website. I just do a direct conversion of that and I upload it to my website for Therapy.com. And I'll do the same thing for the metabase site file. And I've, I've actually you know, already converted the igneous set uh, for theriac domino use. Um, and I've also added um, some of the different versions of melt models. So I, I try to keep my files sort of restricted to the metapelite set, the metabasite set, uh, and now the igneous set. But I do supplement them with additional activity models at times. So an example of that, that metapelite set, I have added some additional uh, phases to it. Uh, some of them that might be used at lower temperature. So they are available. So, you know, you can get in trouble. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's not a bad thing uh, to actually have to sit down and read the database file in the comments. You'll learn a lot by doing that. That's an excellent answer, Doug. Yeah, I know I've learned a lot just from sitting and reading through your comments and notes in the different data files. So I would definitely recommend that. Um, a, a, another kind of more general question here. Uh, what phases cause the most problems for TD calculations? And I suppose you can take that question however you'd like, whether it's from the user point of view or for Theriac Domino itself. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, basically the more complex it is, more end members and more excess Gibbs free energies, the more difficult it is to solve. And I'd say, I haven't sat down and done the, the timing, but I would say the majority of the time that's spent during an equilibrium assemblage minimization is actually spent in the minimizing of the individual solution models to find new local minimum. minimum. Um, the program has changed quite a bit over the years in that area. It has different strategies for minimizing, uh, you know, nine dimensional solution model. Um, and, you know, the ones that can have negative proportions of end members, you know, the more complex the model, the more difficult it gets. Uh, the clinopyroxene model, um, uh, green at all is a fairly difficult one with two order, or actually three, two ordered in members in it. Um, it does struggle with that, particularly uh, at higher pressures. Uh, when the amount of aluminum uh, decreases on one site, it gets really low. It struggles there, um, uh, but you know most of the time it can work through it. Um, and that's where the seeds help. So using the seeds feature. You know, if, if it's if the diagram is having a hard time at let's say low temperature and high pressure, I get some squiggly lines up there. What I'll do is I'll run theriac at some points up there, and occasionally theriac will hit a good point where it has no problem getting a nice local that gives the minimum equilibrium assemblage. I'll then take that seed composition, I'll add it to my file, and that sometimes helps. Um, the other area where there are activity models that it struggles with, and Mark um, alluded to this. Uh, in, in his talk as well. Let's see if I can go back. I, I might have a slide here at the bottom. Um, this, 
Now this is the, uh, and this actually goes back to something that Pierre showed in his thermodynamics talk the other day. So, you know, basically all of the, all of the um, thermal calc uh, mo files for metapelites, metabasites, uh, igneous set, they're all using the Holland Powell 2013 plagioclase feldspar model. I think, uh, I think one of the high pressure um, system files that Tim Holland used, used a different um, feldspar model. Now, uh, for a long time users of thermal calc, uh, they'll know that th this is actually two models. It's two different models. Uh, there's one model for the anorthite rich end of the system, uh, which is so-called PLAG1 model. Um, and then another activity model for the more albite rich end of the system, which is the PLAG C model. And um, this was uh, initially, um, there's a 1998 paper, I think it was on plagioclase feldspar by Holland and Powell, where they showed the DQF approach. Basically what they do is um, they use DQF, pro DQF approach and they'll use one activity model here and they'll make it continuous uh, with uh, the activity model that they use here at the CPAR end. Now this works in thermal calc. And what you do is when you're in thermal calc, you're constructing a line and you're over here at very anorthite rich end and you figure out, hey, I should be using the Plage I model. And you'll just manually say, use the Plage I model here because you've got to tell it every mineral to use. And if you're over here in this part of composition space, you'll say, use the Plage C model. Now you don't, you can't, you don't tell Farag Domino that. If you want them both active at the same time, you have a real problem because it's hard to see here, but there's a blue dashed line here. That's the Gibbs free energy of the Plage I model. And the red line is the Gibbs free energy of the Plage C model. And what you see is that the Plage I model has a lower Gibbs free energy across the whole binary. And what that means is that even if you're predicting albite rich compositions in your diagram, you're gonna be using the Plage I model because that model has a lower Gibbs free energy than the Plage C model over here. And so this becomes a real problem. And it becomes a problem particularly with metabasites at lower temperature. Um, uh, metabasites at higher temperature, you typically over at the Plage I model, intermediate temperature, sometimes you go down to C space, uh, but a low temperature, you, you know, you can be in either the C, Plage C model space or the Plage I bar one model space, uh, depending on your assemblage and system composition. And it becomes very tricky um, to use it in um, Theriac Domino. Uh, I think that's a really good example there, Doug. Yeah, your diagram of the difference between the, the C and the I bar models are um, uh, really nice. Okay, I'll move on to a, to a, um, another question here. Uh, can you calculate, can I calculate AKF or AFM diagrams in Theoretic Domino? I know you mentioned for context, you showed an example of Therta and a, the, the ternary of FETIO, but how about AFM and AKF diagrams? Well, you can, you can, you can calculate AFM diagrams, but you cannot calculate AFM compatibility diagrams and AFM projections. Um, however, you can calculate diagrams, diagrams that come very close to them. So, you know, if you go back to your third year metamorphic petrology class, you'll remember you, you talked about metapelites and you might remember you projected from quartz and H2O and that landed you in the AKFM tetrahedron. You might remember Muscovite and K feldspar plot along the AK join bi type plots in the interior of the diagram, and then all those other minerals, garnet, starlight, cordierite, bi, um, chlorite, um, they all plot on the AFM face. And you know most of the AFM compatibility diagrams that you see are actually ones that are projected from Muscovite or K feldspar. So those diagrams are showing assemblages that actually would be, you know, over towards the potassium richer end of that AKFM tetrahedron. Now you can take that AKFM tetrahedron and you can define a compositional slice through it and you can do equilibrium assemblage diagrams through the AKFM tetrahedron, but they are not projections. Um, I meant to include an example of this and I can't believe I didn't include it. I do this all the time in my third year metamorphic petrology class. One of the rock types I look at are metamorphosed hydrothermally altered rocks where they've had a lot of their potassium um, taken out of the system during hydrothermal alteration. And you end up with um, sort of these uh, chlorite, starlight, cordierite, orthoamphibole, um, clinoamphibole assemblages. And I do a section through the AKFM tetrahedron, but I do it 
between the AFM face and where biotite would plot in the interior, and you get a nice ternary AFM diagram, but it is an equilibrium assemblage diagram. It's a slice through that space. It's not a projection in that space. Excellent. I'd love to see those diagrams at some point myself. They're really interesting rocks. Okay, um, another question here. Uh, as someone who's used both thermocalc and theriac and you know, recommending that approach, how often is it that theriac um, gets a local minimum uh, instead of a global minimum? Um, so I think essentially saying that what's the main cause of theriac domino or theriac not reaching convergence within a reasonable computing time? Um, well, most of the times when it does not reach convergence, um, if it's not a bulk system composition like the ferric, ferrous iron thing that I talked about, um, well, it's very rare for it not to find the global minimum. Um, I think where I've noticed it, and I did notice this about a month ago, um, I was working with um, meta base lights and then switched over to meta P lights. Uh, and I had one of my models formulated in a specific way. And um, for some reason in this model, some of the members can take on negative proportions. And um, for some reason or another, uh, Theriac was not moving into the negative ordered Elmanite part of this space. Um, I finally you know, found a way around that, no problem. Um, that's the only time I've noticed when it doesn't find um, the Gibbs free energy assemblage due to um, a non-system composition problem. Um, now, sometimes when you look at the diagrams, and we do see this, if you look at a domino diagram, you might have two lines which are closely spaced to one another, parallel to one another. Uh, and, and generally these are lines uh, which are going up temp or up pressure with very little temperature change, so, but they're parallel to one another. And it represents um, a miscibility gap. It's where at low temperature, you're going from one phase stable, uh, and then you have a miscibility gap. And then at the higher temperature, um, you go back to one phase stable. So this happens in the amphiboles, it happens in the elmanites, hematites. So at low temperature, you have one, you know, maybe hematite, and then you have elmanite plus hematite, and then you have elmanite. And in the gridded approach, uh, when it starts off its minimization, sometimes it will jump over that miscibility gap. And, and it won't realize that there was an assemblage change there. And um, it's, it's tied up with how it identifies minerals. Well, this is another thing. Let me go back to a slide. I better point this out because this is actually one of the most problematic things. Um, and I don't have an example here. I have to explain it to you. Um, well, if we look here at pyrotite, this is PO. PO stands for pyrotite. And there's two end members, trot and trov here. Um, and here you can see that this TROV member has uh, the highest proportion. So it's identified pyrotite. It's put this underscore TROV. So it's appended the phase name by the most abundant phase member. And um, um, sometimes when it goes across a miscibility gap, when you go across a miscibility gap, this identifying phase won't change. It'll be the same on both sides of the miscibility gap. And at that point in time, it, it can jump right over that miscibility gap and it won't know that it was there. And so it, it, it doesn't get the whole thing calculated. Another thing to watch out for, and unfortunately I don't have an example of that here. Um, some end members like, uh, I think uh, the pyrope end member in Garnet here in this particular model, it can take on a negative proportion. And um, you see this in the amphiboles, you see it uh, quite a lot uh, in some of the pyroxenes. And so if you take an amphibole example, it might identify clinoamphibole, and then it'll have an underscore G-R-U-N. Well, that's grunerite. 
So you think to yourself, when you're looking at the output, you see clinoamphibole underscore grunerite. So you think, hey, that must be an iron magnesium amphibole. That's not, it's not a calcic amphibole. That's one of the iron magnesium amphibole coming tonight grunerite series. But in fact, that's not necessarily the case. What happens is that there's, there's coming tonight grunerite along the iron magnesium joint of amphibole, but then there's two in, ordered end members, A and B. And what happens is those A and B uh, end members can take on negative values uh, sometimes. And so you end up with A and B that becomes quite negative. And what happens is the proportion of grunerite goes way up to compensate for it. But in fact, the amphibole composition is a calcic amphibole composition. It's not, a, it's not an iron magnesium amphibole composition. So that's where when you're running theriac, when you see uh, those complex minerals, look at the proportions, but then also go down and look at your site compositions and um, make sure that it's telling you grunerite is the most abundant phase component. Make sure that it's the most of, make sure that it's not a calcium rich amphibole. It could be a calcium rich amphibole. And the solution is perfectly valid. It's just that it's just telling you what the most abundant end member proportion value is. So I hope that made sense. I, I, maybe I'll be able to show an example of that a little bit later. Yeah, no, that was, that was great, Doug. Okay, one more question, and then I think we might flip back and ask Mark a couple since we're now in the open session. Um, what defines the precision to which assemblage boundaries are determined, um, both in composition and PT? Is it user specified somewhere or hard coded? And if it's hard coded, what is it? Um, it's user specifiable. You can specify it. Um, there's two places to do this. So if you're doing a diagram and you want to specify the precision to how closely lines are found um, on your diagram, in other words, how, how closely it's bracketed between two Gibbs minimizations, um, there's user input. So when you first start up Domino, it prompts you for a bunch of questions. Um, and one of the questions towards the last ones, it, it asks you for a spacing or precision parameter. And what that parameter is, is it's actually, it's not an absolute PT value, it's a distance on your diagram. So one of the, one of the queries that the program asks you is how many centimeters do you want your, perhaps your, your diagram to be? You know, generally they default to like 15 centimeters. And you specify a, a, a precision. It's actually, a, a, I believe, a millimeter precision, if I remember correctly. And so that will control um, how closely those lines are together. I use the default values. I hardly ever use a non-default value. Um, and... Usually, if you zoom in on your final diagram, you'll see that your lines don't exactly connect. Uh, they fall short of connecting. Like if I were to be able to zoom in on this. You'll see that. But you can barely yeah, small little gaps there between there. Them. Yeah. a little gap between uh, 50, 57, 89. Well, that's the default type of gap. If you want that even closer, you, you would change that parameter at the end, at the command line um, and make it a little bit smaller. It result in an extra level of calculation. Um, now, for the precision of uh, composition of phases, so the compositional variability precision, that's actually controlled in a file called theriac.ini. Um, this is a file that you know, a new user would never modify, but an intermediate to advanced user modifies quite a bit. I modify mine all the time. Um, but there's a parameter in there, it's called del x min. And that's the parameter that controls, you know, how closely spaced your, your different phases can be. And the default setting is 10 to the minus ninth. Um, and so, um, you know, it's almost continuous solid solution space. You know, you know the, from one co composition to the next closest composition you can reach, it's 10 to the minus ninth along some sum of vectors. Um, and that's it's generally uh, 
perfectly fine. I do run mine down around minus 11 or minus 12 occasionally for certain activity models. But usually the minus eight, 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus nine spacing um, is adequate. But that's where you can control that in theory and I. That's great. Thanks, Doug. Okay, right. Well, just quickly before we move back to Mark, um, somebody uh, is sending me a comment here that we were talking about these AFM diagrams. And if uh, if you go and read the Decapitani and Petrokakis 2010 paper, they plot some pseudo AFM diagrams. And if you want to reproduce those, all the files I think are available on uh, Christine Decapitani's website. So if anyone's interested in that, that might be of use to them. 